Hey fellas, we're now live. Should probably move the mic a little bit actually. How's everyone doing? I'm using a new system now, so I've got a slightly different uh, setup. So if there are any errors, just let me know in the chat. So today I, I saw something kind of interesting on Discord. I saw this um, this TikTok video from this fella, this uh, Jack Dot Lauro, and it's not a really um, not a really short TikTok actually. It's five minutes. So I, I was watching through it. And I thought it would be something interesting to respond to for you guys. And maybe we could do a bit of a QA and a afterwards. But um, yeah, first of all, I want to know how um, everyone's doing just as we wait people to come in. Uh, great, unfortunately missed the Divine Liturgy today. That's sad. Uh, mass is great. So yeah, I, I suppose if the guy ever watches this, he now knows I'm a Roman Catholic. So I am Roman Catholic. This is kind of applicable. He talks about Americans in the video. But, um, obviously, I'm British. He's British, as we'll hear. So, there is kind of a cultural commonality there. And that that's going to be quite interesting, I think. Um, because I have a very strong opinion on Roe v. Wade. Of course, I'm very much against um, abortion of all forms. I think it should be banned. Um, and I will elaborate to what extent I think it should be punished. Because I do believe it's a crime. Um... As we get into the video, but um, I, I won't spoil it for um, pro-choice people who are watching because I want to talk about some of the reasoning uh, the 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 pro the pro-life people have because it doesn't appear that this fellow is very aware of that and understandably so, right? It's not it's not exactly something that's shouted from the te the tree chop uh, the tree tops even uh, in our society. So um, looks like we've got sixteen people watching. Uh, um, please just uh, go ahead and like ask questions and stuff as we go. Um, I guess since we've got that many people, uh, we'll just get started. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of pausing too. He says a, there's a lot of information in here. So, um, you know, it's not going to be like just him kind of like going on. So, yeah, let's start. As cathartic as it would be for me to go on a rant about Roe v. Wade... I'm aware that it's at least likely that some of my audience are young Americans who consider themselves either Christian, conservative, or simply pro-life. And they might earnestly and without malice believe- uh, yeah, Actually, that's a point. Yeah, um, if I see anybody insulting the guy in any way, uh, you're going to be banned from the chat. ...believe that this position is a morally good and righteous one. So this video is addressed to those people. I want to explain to you why I am pro-choice and why I think you're wrong. To my mind, the question of whether life- Yeah, actually, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go back a little bit on it. Keep tabs on the chat as I'm doing this. Yeah, so um, he's made it very clear that he is of the pro-choice uh, persuasion. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to say is uh, going to sound pretty spicy. Um, but this isn't because I, I'm disliking or insulting the guy. But because it naturally follows from the positions that he develops in the video. I, I think. And I think to be very hard-nosed about um, this um, might actually expose the issues here. I think you're wrong. To my mind, the question of whether life begins at conception is actually irrelevant. I don't think it does, but even if it did, body sovereignty is more important. It's the same. So, you see, this is this is what I mean, right? So, if bodily sovereignty is more important than human life, then that leads us to some very strange conclusions, because that would mean that for if we were speaking unequivocally here. That would mean that for any particular circumstance where someone is inhibiting your autonomy, you would have the ability to kill someone. Let's, let's assume that life does begin at conception, as I, of course, believe. And it's an exactly and it's exactly the same kind of life, uh, fundamentally. Let's assume that for a moment. Equi that is being equivalent to an adult, right? This would mean that you wouldn't need any reason at all beyond I'm being like held back from something to kill anybody. And that could be your boyfriend, your uh, your girlfriend, that could be your wife, that could be your mother, that could be a uh, son, daughter, this could be anybody. If we treat this in an absolute sense. So I think that he probably doesn't mean this. At least I sincerely hope he doesn't mean this. But holding to this kind of ethical position does not have does not have like circum doesn't lead to circumstances that really follow with our our moral instinct 
I don't I don't think it's it's very sound. The same reason why, even if my life depended on you giving me a kidney, or donating blood to me, or even giving me nine months of your time, I, or the state, cannot force you to do so. It's also worth- Yeah, but I would think if you went into an NHS hospital, and they decided not to give you a kidney, uh, say they, they felt that the taxpayer's wallet was being, was being violated, I don't think you'd be very happy. If we- if we didn't- if we had a situation where there were abs there was absolute bodily autonomy like let's let's set aside the issue of um you know of um, organ donation right i believe that people shouldn't generally be forced to give organs but if we extend this out further then you could never throw anybody into prison because you would be violating their bodily autonomy by putting them into prison so i don't believe this principle is sound you could have a situation where you have a rapist or a murderer and you could give them life in prison as, as the society should. But if that were a violation of, of autonomy, then it would be above the value of a life. Now, I don't know how you could do the calculus of adding lives together, but it doesn't strike me. If we're talking about a difference of category rather than degree, there's no reason why a serial killer should be in prison for murdering his victims. If, if say, say he was mentally ill and decided they were impeding his freedom, say they were impeding his sexual freedom, like, say he desired to have sex with all these young women and they refused and that was impeding his bodily autonomy to do that. You, you see, I, I don't like this principle of bodily autonomy because nobody in reality actually follows it, even aside from the ridiculous scenarios that I've just presented to you here. We put people in prison all of the time. And we force people to have vaccines too in some places. Like, would you would you say that the vaccine mandates in, pla in places where it would be forced would be morally just? I don't think so. I didn't take the vaccine. Thankfully, we didn't have that. But there were certainly people who did. And it tended to not come from the pro-life crowd. Let's see, is there anyone in the chat? No. Grimly noting that in the US, this even applies to corpses. Unless the person opted in while they were alive, you can't take organs from their body. Like, the, the problem with this, though, is that this is an issue of legal precedent and not moral precedent. Legal precedents follow from moral precedents. The reason why we have any law at all in, in the state isn't just by fiat, or at least it shouldn't be. In the Anglosphere, it's always flowed from a an idea of natural law. Before that, in Europe, we had moral principles from which legal precedents were extracted as well. It's only very recently where we've de decided to make it sick fiat as the, as the judges decide. So reasoning from American law to moral principle doesn't, doesn't necessarily make sense. For example, right, the idea um, behind Roe v. Wade, one of them anyway, was that women should be permitted an abortion on the basis of the right to privacy. Now, I don't see how that follows, but it was obviously challenged and struck down. So there is, like, leeway on this. It, and it, it flows ultimately from legal principle, which is what, when we're talking about the morality of an abortion... We're speaking more about moral principle before before legal legal rule sets, and this argument implicitly assumes a moral principle, regardless of whether someone's life depends on it. For me, that's case closed. The life of conception argument is irrelevant. Your legal body sovereignty is enough to entitle you to an abortion. Well, I mean, like let's let's restate this and see if you actually like how um, what you've just said makes sense. You've basically just said to me that murder is perfectly fine if it's a violation of bodily autonomy. Because that's ex that's exactly what you've said. If we assume that life begins at conception. Because that, that that's exactly what you've just said. It's not a moral issue, it's a legal issue. But of Well, I mean, it is. Unless you want to say that murder is something that's morally neutral. But I don't think anybody would say that. The issue is indeed whether life begins at conception or not. Of course, it's worth mentioning some other points as well. 
And also, I think that there'll be nuances, but we'll get onto that. In well, a firstly, there's the observation that abortions are actually a form of healthcare. Pregnancy is extremely risky, and there are endless complications that can happen during it that can. Well, well like, I mean, that's like saying that murdering your abusive husband is an act is an act of um, healthcare because it's protecting your mental health. Put a woman's life at risk, from an ectopic pregnancy to even the act of childbirth itself. Abortions actually save lives. Then there's the observation that this will disproportionately affect the poor. Those who aren't able to leave the state to get an abortion will be forced to give birth to a child that they cannot afford, further pushing them and their families into poverty. Then there's... Well, you see, all of these questions here are matters of, matters of, matters of moral principle. Um, so the question is, is, um, is financial... Uh, are financials more valuable than human life? Uh, yes or no? I mean, we've already seen here that Without directly stating it, you're saying that bodily autonomy is greater than the value of human life. So, um, is is it the case that a bank account is more valuable than human life? Of course, we're not discussing here whether or not a like life begins at conception. If this is a purely legal argument, um, I don't think it is. Um, but think about it. Like you are entailing. A situation where you have to have a really strange order of moral priorities uh, if you accept this. It's a practical realization that, at the same time, some abortions will still happen. That, by doing this. Yes, of course, and some murders still happen. You are simply banning legal, safe abortions. You are... Well, I mean, this, this implies. This again assumes implicitly that there is no human life as, our, as us in the womb at the time of the abortion. Like, I would say that there is no such thing as a safe and legal abortion. It doesn't exist because there is always a murder in it. Actually putting more life at risk by making them illegal. You may have been fed this line of reasoning that says that, aside from cases where pregnancy was violently forced onto a woman, if she gets pregnant from consensual sex, it's kind of her fault, even if she was using contraception because she knew the risks, and so... She she should have to deal with the consequences. Well, I mean, yeah, but that's besides the point when it comes to abortion. The question is whether or not murdering an infant is... Well, killing an infant in the womb is, is murder. Uh, the, I, I find the idea of all this convoluted talk of rape and of, um, you know, of incest, I find that to be irrelevant to the question. Because the act of existence of the child is, at that point, not dependent on the act that conceived it. It's only secondarily responsible. Consider this. Suppose I get hit by a car when crossing the street at a crosswalk or zebra crossing. Uh, okay, like, I, I can't even... I'm not even going to listen to the whole of this, because he just goes on for a bit about this. The difference between you crossing the road and getting hit by a car and somebody getting pregnant through sex is that there is a discrete, perf there is a discrete purpose to sex. Now, this isn't a religious argument. As I'm sure they will say, they will say, well, it, you know, you'll find your life begins at conception in the Bible. Uh, you know, this is a, a Christian belief that sex has the purpose of procreation. And of course, this is complete nonsense. You could recognize this without religion. This is just natural reason. I mean, like the reason we call them genitals is from gens, right? It's related to the word gens, which means family. It is apparent to everybody involved in the act of sex that it is the one act the one natural act that is responsible for the production of children now a zebra crossing is only remote only remotely entails a risk of getting hit by a car but it's the very purposes and the very very essence of the sexual act is to reproduce so this is this is comparing apples with oranges but of course, I'm probably going to hear something along the lines of, well, we don't believe in telos because we're atheists. Or because we don't have religious views. But the trouble is, is that this comes from natural reason. This isn't something that proceeds from religious principles. You can find it in Aristotle. You can find it, like, I, I don't know how you could reach a position where you couldn't say sex leads to children. This is obvious to almost everybody. Sure, it also leads to pleasure. Sure, it also leads to bonding. But that that result and that purpose is already there. 
somewhere where it's legal to do so. Cars are meant to stop for me, but they don't, and I get hit. Is it my fault? Obviously, a part of me... Well, yeah, exactly, but like I've said, everybody knows that the act of sex is there to produce children. The act of crossing the road, particularly a red light, or particularly a green light, does not entail us getting hit. It's a question of why the thing is there. He knows that when I cross a road, even if it's at a legal, safe place, there's a chance that I could get hit by a car. And if you wanted to, you could... I feel like actually I should spend a bit more time elaborating upon this. So, uh, upon the, the sex, uh, uh, the sex aspect. Because what I've just said there is, is the intrinsic end of the Human Sex Act, right? Like, it's apparent that sex has three effects, at least when it's done properly. Procreation which is unrelated to, of course, the physical action of the partners, insofar as, the, insofar as it produces the other effects. I'll say that. Okay. It's, it's largely unrelated to how the partners behave. Then you have the unitive act, which is where the partners are united together. And then you have the act of central pleasure. Now, these are intrinsic results of the sexual act. And they can be said to be telos, because telos, which is like purpose, doesn't necessarily pertain to the extrinsic end of sex. So my pointing out of these things does not entail that reproduction is the prime end of sex. It just says that that's a result of sex in the same way that boiling water to produce steam uh, to power a nuclear power station, well, to, to um, you know lead to a nuclear power station generating electricity, doesn't comment about the fact that, you know, uh, H2O becomes gas at 100 degrees centigrade, right? We're talking about intrinsic aspects of this. Now, I think everyone can concede the intrinsic aspects of sex. Even people who don't believe in some extrinsic end where we would have, you know, a Catholic moral theology of sex where there would be restriction to sex within marriage and to being open towards procreation and stuff like this, because there isn't an acceptance of any extrinsic goal. However, I don't think this is relevant for this particular discussion, because we're discussing the intrinsic end of sex. Everybody knows that you have sex to get pregnant. That is an intrinsic end of it, in the same way that when you boil water, there is steam produced. The extrinsic end is also quite important as well, but that We'll, we'll talk... I think... Actually, we could discuss that now. Because this comes down to the purpose of the state. So... And this this links to the legal arguments he's been making. So, what's the purpose of the state, ultimately? Is it to produce human pleasure, as I believe many people in uh, on the left and those who support Roe v. Wade think? Or is it in order to produce a virtuous populace? Is it... the Is the idea behind the state to make people... Um, enjoy a state of pleasure until they die or to perfect the people now I would say that the purpose of the state is that is there fundamentally to grow people in those virtues that perfect them because this is where freedom is found freedom is not found in a multitude of rights it's found in the correct disposition of the people you know it you can give all of the rights on a piece of paper you want to a heroin addict but at the end he's a heroin addict and likewise, you can have a slave who, like like a literal slave, but if he has himself in order, he's going to be much more free than the heroin addict. And so I would argue that the reason why abortion is contrary to virtue is because it's an act of cruelty. The majority of these women, you, like you, you watch these women when they talk about their abortions and they come up with all of these these different circumstances as to why it's okay. They'll, they'll say, oh, I was poor. Oh, I was, um, you know, it was going to destroy my career. Or something like that. Or, you know, some of them will just more openly hate babies, right? These, these people are placing concerns, material concerns, and, to be honest, their own egos, over the existence of another human life. Now, this is at the very least an act of pride, if not of deliberate cruelty. Now, pride is the greatest vice because it leads to somebody having an inordinate belief in what they are. So you will have these women who will believe that their career is more important than the child. 
And what that entails is really an inordinate love of themselves, which is the destruction of all other virtues. So you will not have, you will not have women who are who are prideful, who have balanced moral lives. You might have a chaste and arrogant woman, but she will likely be lacking in other essential parts of uh, the moral virtues. So they might they might lack the ability to control their temper. They're probably going to be highly imprudent because of because they overestimate the value of themselves. That leads them to miscalculate other circumstances, say social conditions, and that leads to tension. And that leads to other mistakes down the line. Right? So if we have a situation where we're justifying abortion on the basis of really anything, uh the possible exception I mean even idolatry. Like I could see I mean, in the same way that I can see somebody justifying abortion on the basis of their career, I can see someone justifying it on the basis of, yeah, idolatry. But that leads to the same problem of idolatry being contrary to natural law, because we are naturally built to worship God. And this, and as much as that sounds like a religious comment, it, it bloody well isn't, because you can see this reasoning in Aristotle about the existence of this god uh, the god of the bible um, i will say although of course aristotle as far as we as far as i know was a pagan right but the god that is pointed to by aristotle is the same with with uh, fewer details than the one of the bible right we can know him by natural reason his existence so and that entails a natural right of um, of worshiping a natural um, responsibility of worshiping that god so because of his nature I'll, i won't elaborate here if if jack lauro if you're interested you know i have other channels and i can talk in the comment section about this but we have this this situation where you're permitting quite literally a vicious act which is drawing the women of the society away from the natural perfection that the state should be there for if you give them a society of pure pleasure and pure choice then you're actually just destroying uh, the women I think I've ranted for long enough. I'm going to quickly check the chat. Charlie Adams uh, retracted a bunch of uh, comments. If you guys want to ask questions, by the way, um, yeah. Argue that if I really didn't want to get hit by a car, I should never cross a road or go near a road again. But that would clear... But there's, there's a difference between remote occasion of getting hit by a car and near occasion of producing a child when you're having sex. Really be absurd. Just because you know that there's a risk involved in an act does not mean that you should be blamed or that you consented... I think that the idea that it's a risk factor is kind of obscene as well, because human beings are great. To that risk being realised. Or suppose further still, I get to the ripe old age of 80 and I finally get hit by a car for the first time while crossing a road. How malicious and evil would it be for someone to say to me, yeah, well, you've crossed a lot of roads, it was bound to happen eventually, you were asking for it. That would be insane. I would also ask you to take note about how this line of reasoning necessarily puts the moral blame on the woman in question. And I would... I mean... In the case where they consensually had sex, then, well, yeah, I mean, if you choose to engage in an act that is intrinsically ordered towards the reproduction of a child, then you are responsible for that child. Now, I would say in rape that isn't the case, but that doesn't change the question of whether or not an abortion is a murder. It's, this isn't about... This, this issue of abortion, in my view, has nothing to do with culpability for any particular act suggest that that is not an accident. The last thing I want to say is aside from this obviously being an inherently very emotional topic, it's extremely easy for people on my side to view pro-lifers as actively malicious. And that Well, I mean, of course it's, it's an intrinsically very um, emotionally difficult uh, topic to discuss. There are a lot of women who are very frightened of rape, and that's why they make the my body my choice argument. Because deep in the female psyche, and this isn't helped by the state of men, because, like, most men are addicted to pornography and women intrinsically, I suspect, pick up on that. The, the fact that they're unchaste and therefore they're untrustworthy. Like, yes, of course it's an emotional issue, but that doesn't change the the fact that we can reason to this about this objectively without doing this kind of thing. That's because they are inconsistent. These are the types who will talk of America being the land of the free, whereby, supposedly... So yeah, 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 freedom being... The being the interior disposition of the people. This isn't the land of like I don't think America. 
And certainly my view of freedom, the classical view of freedom, certainly doesn't entail having, like, all the rights. It's not, it's not land of the licentious. It's land of the free, which is those who have no arbitrary control in their lives and where the laws are set in such a way as to encourage the virtue of the people. As long as your beliefs or actions don't impose on the freedom of others, people should... Well, yeah, I disagree with that too. I mean, like, I, I don't I don't think that... Okay, actually, let's repeat what he just said. I want to make sure that I've got... Because I've gotten... I've got a very, uh, very poor short-term memory. Supposedly, so long as your beliefs or actions don't impose on the freedom of others, people should be free to believe what they want and worship... Well, yeah, but I think that I probably believe that in a far more um, extensive way than the average American, let alone you. Who they want, without risk of persecution or fear. This is noble, and I agree with it. But they say all this and then rejoice when the Supreme Court clearly acts to damage that freedom. Take yeah, because you have two different definitions of freedom. Now, insofar as people believe that freedom is license, then, I mean, that becomes a problem then. But they could just argue, well, abortion is murder, and then you're back to square one. Because they could say, well, there are limits, limits to license. Taking away what will likely be the first of many steps to impose religiously rooted dogmatic views on others, with other rights, such as the right to gay marriage, likely being next. These well, I mean, you could... <laughs> like, a lot, of these, a lot of these things are uh, natural law. <laughs> like, like, the gay marriage thing is, is against natural law. This isn't something to do with what the Bible says. <laughs> And that's why it took so long. Like, you have all of these deists, and granted, they, they were largely Protestant, the first Americans, but you, you have, how do I put this? Like, you have intrinsic rights in you de independent of religion, and the argument would run that because the sexual act is not fulfilled in the ways that I've stated from its intrinsic ends in, in a gay relationship, then there can't be gay marriage. These are the types who will talk about how sacred life is in this debate, but when it comes to economic or healthcare or gun control policies, their actions suggest that the majestic beauty and divinity of life is suddenly... Okay, let me, let me talk about the gun rights thing, because I'm actually pro-Second Amendment. Uh, guns are a tool. Guns are there to go hunting with, and they're there to defend yourself. The support of gun rights does not entail supporting mass shootings. Also... The act of somebody deciding to shoot up a school is an act of their mind and is disconnected from the gun. So, someone could brutally murder a child with a hammer, right? Does that mean we should ban hammers? No, it means that we should be preventing the kinds of dispositions in people that allow them to take a hammer and murder a child. We, this is why we need freedom in the sense that I've just described. Because that kind of freedom, that kind of moral discipline, and by moral I mean like ethical discipline, is going to lead to people being less likely to murder children with hammers or guns. But in terms of like social and economic freedom, I mean economic freedom as far as I'm concerned is dependent on state in life. Something that is a lot, is a lot lower than modern people think. You know, you have people before the 19th century who are incredibly poor. You know, the, you have very rich, you know, even the richest of people, the kings. They didn't necessarily have as much as we do now, but they still had freedom. They, they had the freedom that I described earlier on. And it's similar with social. Now, I would say that the social and economic situation makes it potentially harder to develop those dispositions. But I don't think that you're somehow being anti-life because you say oppose an extensive welfare state. I think that there should be an equivalent to a social uh, a welfare state. I think that these are often a very good idea, depending on situations. But I think that the bet the ideal situation would be where people are giving to charity, and that's what's taking care of the poor. Lost on them. That yes, while life is sacred, what is more sacred is the right to carry a gun. These are the types who will talk about scripture and God's will and completely ignore the fact that the Bible doesn't say anything explicit about abortion at all. Yeah, but it also doesn't say anything explicit about the Immaculate Conception, but we can still reason from the scriptures. The, like, there are explicit doctrines in the scriptures that anybody can read in there, like Jesus being the Messiah. But 
there are many things in there that are a lot harder to track down. Now, you can make, I think, an absolutely irrefutable argument from the scriptures about life beginning in conception. Right? Jesus, for example. Like, the conception of Jesus in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Like, how can you name... How can you name a child before he's conceived? And how can you how can you have a situation where Christ is fully God and fully man if the personhood isn't present at conception? There's also the case of Jeremiah in the first in the first chapter of Jeremiah, where God visits Jeremiah in the womb. So, so say like for example, you know, actually I'm not going to go into that because I was going to talk about aborting Jesus. But uh, I don't think that's right. But I think that you can make a very strong case from the scripture about life beginning from conception. Now he's about to go on about various laws in the Old Testament about, about children being miscarried. right? And he's going to say they're, they're lower penalties than being murdered like a regular person. Yes, but the thing is, is that that doesn't imply that there is a qualitative difference in the act. Because the act itself is not connected actually you know what? i'm going to save this for later on because he's going to start going on about cells and that's when this is going to become more interesting and if anything there's evidence in the bible that a fetus does not have the same moral weight as an infant such as in exodus 21 22 to 25 and he yeah and i would also say to that well in malachi it says that the lord despises divorce yet divorce is permitted in the old law as well you know there are there are certain things in there that are permitted for certain reasons. Even with the non-religious conservatives who believe that life begins at conception, it's unclear why they stop there. Why doesn't life begin before conception? After all, a sperm cell and an egg cell are... Well, I mean, this... Okay, they, he, this came quicker than I thought. Well, the reason is, is the same reason why I can kill a chicken, and that's not a moral, immoral action, but I can kill a human being, and that's a, that's a grave sin. And the reason is, is because a human person has that aspect to them that is in the likeness and image of God, as the scriptures say. Now, a non-religious conservative could reason in the same way. It's the observation that the human person has an immaterial aspect of themselves, the intellect and the will, which ennobles them above other creatures. So, my state of having an intellect and a will places me above my dog. This being, like, the ability to reason immaterially, right? Right? This is also coincidentally a reason why AI will never have the intelligence of human persons because human people have that immaterial, passive and active intellect. And a non-religious person can come to that conclusion too. You know, you'll see reasoning about the soul like this in... I mean, Descartes was a religious, but Descartes. You'll find it in Plato. You'll find it in, in Plotinus. You'll find this in, of course, St. Thomas Aquinas. Right? You, you have... A tradition of people arguing for the nobility of the immaterial faculties of the human person and this begins at conception because and I'm gonna reason here from the incarnation right I can't speak for um for non-religious conservatives I don't see any reason I, I would say it would be fitting that a human baby would have these at conception Aristotle would disagree that he believes that the soul develops uh, like as time goes by in the womb. But I would say because you have the state where Jesus actually I'm going to open the window, it's boiling hot in here. I thought my reasoning. So you have a situation where Jesus is conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And we know from natural reason that man is composed of two separate um, self-existent substances. And by self-existent, I mean they exist independent of one another. You have the immaterial mind, the intellect and the will, that I've just described, which we can reason to because our thoughts are not divisible. Right? If you, you can't cut a thought into pieces, even if you were to write it out on a piece of paper, like if I have some notes, if I cut a word out of that, then that thought ceases to exist. Right? We can reason that the intellect is in that state because of that. And um, Plotinus makes a similar point. And then you have the body, which is which is evident. But because the body is divisible and the mind isn't, they are both different substances. Now, man is composed of these two things. So, for Christ to be conceived and to be said to be true, truly um, fully God and fully man, that would entail that Christ 
at least have the potential, and to be honest, I'd say the actuality of that intellect and body uh, union on top of the divine nature, which would entail that the, uh, the thing that ennobles human beings was in Christ at his conception. And therefore, we would have to say that the thing that makes man noble is there at conception, therefore abortion is murder. And I think, I like that's that's just a, an explicit argument derived from scripture. But and I've realized I'm realizing that a lot of the arguments that I'm making in the stream could be better. But as I dwell on them at length, like this, they're they're developing. So I've come out with funny things that don't necessarily follow initially. But as I'm developing them, developing them here now, it makes a lot more sense. So like with the Jeremiah and Luke comment I made earlier on, right now a non-religious conservative couldn't make a definitive statement like that. They don't have scripture. But I do think they could make a pity in this argument for that. Let's see about the comments in the chat. We do a review of Carnidus' channel on his argument for abortion. Um, I don't know. Should we execute abortion doctors because we execute those who commit first degree murder or abortion checks on the same boxes? And yes. Does debating people like this really help them change their mind or is this just a matter of asking the Holy Spirit to help them see the error of their ways? I don't know. I just thought it was something interesting to talk about. Aren't these doctors using these abortions to get sem their stem cells to sell? People should really stop worshipping mammon. I don't know if, this, if the doctors themselves uh, do this um, at all. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's another issue. Uh, I won't touch that one because I don't know. Tangibly alive, they each represent half of a person. Why is it not a moral tragedy every single time a sperm cell or an unfertilized... You know, interestingly, I, I seem to recall one of the church fathers seeing, saying that each contraceptive act of sex is actually kind of like a, a clandestine version, uh, a clandestine murder. Uh, so I can see this argument being made, but I don't think it's because of the cell. It's like, like my semen dying, um, is is the same. In fact, they're actually they have less chromosomes than the blood that runs through my veins, right? So if I, it's like my, that's like me cutting myself, right? It's not a moral charity, uh, tragedy when my red blood cells die because they don't have that likeness and image of God. But the killing of a person because of that is, in fact, a tragedy. That's, that's why. ...egg cell dies. Why not hook up a machine to every man's testicles that collects and freezes and stores every single sperm he ever produced so that one day it can be made into a fully formed human life? That idea sounds ludicrous to me, but it's not at all clear why it would be for them. <laughs> There's, there's part of me that's tempted to say a base, but um, <laughs> if in fact the existence of any life is due to a long series of past events, why do we arbitrarily pick a moment in time for life to begin? Sorry. It's a past events. Actually, I want to go back to that because this is a, this could be an interesting thing to discuss. The existence of any life is due to a long series of past events. Why do we arbitrarily pick a moment in time for life to be begin? That well, okay, that, like, I'll, 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 uh, you know, I'll let him go for a little bit longer. That maximally puts all of the moral burden and responsibility on women. Hell. Well, I mean, we're not, right? But the larger point to be made is that I disagree with the premise of the question. I don't think that life entirely proceeds just from past events. And this is actually exactly why, um, you know, there is moral power in the scriptures to the moral laws. Because what you've just described there is known as an accidental causal chain. You know, um, my dad has, um, you know, given the sperm for me to be born. You know, I, I, with any luck, will have given my wife sperm to have a child. Right? So, we have this. This is an accidental causal chain. But the thing is, is that the being that each of us possesses doesn't originate in this process. Like, my arm, for example... My arm, it's composed of fingers, and those are composed of knuckles and, and um, fingernails, and then it goes all the way down to the constituent atoms, and then eventually it reaches existence. When you hear um, the cosmological arguments of St. Thomas Aquinas, this is what he means. He doesn't mean, like, like father, son, right? My son, when God willing I have him, is not going to be dependent on my existence once my wife, um, you know, conceives. But... My child will always be reliant on the existence of God to provide his being, because God is nothing else than existence itself. So, so I'd refute that premise. 
And in fact, this is actually precisely why we would hold God to have moral power in our lives, because he provides our existence. And that's 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 what orders a religious um, extrinsic end. So like beyond just I get a woman pregnant by using my genitals. Like I have an I have a higher end to that because of where my existence is derived. Well, why don't we fix this problem altogether and just mandate that as soon as every man is fertile, he is forced to get a vasectomy. Have it so that the only way he can get this procedure because that's gravely disordered because the genitals are there to produce children. Undone is with a woman's written consent. Why don't why don't like alternatively why don't we just um you know like like po like put like a cage over everyone's genitals so they're not allowed to touch nonsense in order for her to get pregnant and as soon as she does test pregnant he is forced once again to have another vasectomy now you might say this would be impractical but come on according to you there are lives at stake here this would literally prevent murders and it would solve the need for illegal unsafe i mean it it, it wouldn't I mean, like, I don't believe that the death of a, of a sperm cell, as I've articulated, is a murder. I think if there are people... Actually, no. If abortions as well, it would mean that almost all pregnancies would be consensual and planned. If you're a pro-life bloke who doesn't like that idea, why? Is it because you value your bodily autonomy? Is it because you don't like the idea? No, it's because I value the intrinsic end of my genitals. It would be against natural law for me to get a vasectomy. Also, like, I'm not having sex anyway. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, like, why would this matter to me? The idea of someone else controlling your reproductive power? To my mind, all of these inconsistencies betray one simple thing. Many pro-lifers... You haven't investigated the pro-life position in much detail. ...don't really believe their own rhetoric. It suggests that they are, in fact, not pro-life, but pro-power. Pro-tyranny of women, pro-forced... Tyranny of women? What, so, like, I know that's not what you meant, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna take the mickey. <laughs> Birth. It suggests that pro-life is simply an extremely successful act of marketing, and if you do find yourself on that side, I think you should consider whether it's been mislabeled. Okay, that's the video. Right. Any questions, fellas? Any final questions before I close up the stream? I'm just gonna type that in the chat because it's gonna take uh, time to... Actually, I don't think I will. I'll just wait for you fellas. Right, okay, so I'm going to give you three minutes. I'd be kind of interested to see the guy respond. I really doubt that he will. The strongest argument for abortion is eugenics. Um, well, I mean, that assumes that human beings have the knowledge to perfect their race through eugenics. So, I mean, you could, you could argue against that not only moral grounds, but also on grounds of, you know, epistemology. Actually, let's see, I'll, I'll uh, give you one more minute. I'm not going to give you until 11. Yeah. I'm just fiddling with this uh, the slinky. Like, I don't even have stairs in this house. I just found it. So, it's just been in my hand constantly. It's, uh, it's really irritating. It's something, like, nice to fiddle with. Okay, so I'll take it that no one has any questions. So, um, thanks a lot for watching, everyone. And I will uh, see you guys later. Bye-bye.